So, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Janina Eden. She's a fourth year resident in our clinic and will talk about the surgical management of colorectal liver metastasis. The Thank you so yours. much. Um, yeah, welcome to today's lecture. Um, as I was said in the introduction, I will talk about the surgical management of colorectal liver metastases. Let's go over the agenda real quick. I will talk about the epidemiology, I will talk about liver metastases, I will talk about treatment options and preoperative workup, and I will focus on the surgical options. Epidemiology first. As we all know, um, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer in men, and it is the second most common cancer in women. We have about 4,000 cases per year in Switzerland and about 1,600 deaths per year in Switzerland. The median age of the colorectal cancer to occur is between 71 and 73 years of age, and the five-year survival rate for all stages is 65%, and of course it, it decreases the further advanced the cancer is, so it drops down to about 14% when you got stage four. Some facts about liver metastases in general. The liver is the number one metastatic site in CRC patients, and synchronous liver metastases occur in about one quarter of all patients. In numbers for Switzerland, again, we have about 4,000 cases per year, colorectal carcinoma, and we have about 1,000 cases where liver mets are present. About the physiology, the main drainage is through the hepatic portal venous system. That's why we get liver metastases first. And then there is an exception, which is the very distal colon and the rectum. There the drainage is via caval drainage, so we get lung metastases first. About the blood supply, about metastases. Microscopic tumors get drained via the portal venous system, and macroscopic ones, you can see on imaging, they get the blood supply via the hepatic artery, mainly. Let's talk about the treatment options. We have three main modalities. One is surgery, local destruction, and I'm not going to go into detail about that, and chemotherapy. It's always an individual approach, and it needs to be discussed in an interdisciplinary conference. So we need to discuss it together with gastroenterologists, with oncologists, radiologists, and us, of course. And it's almost always a combination of two or more modalities, and that means <coughs> surgery, for example, in combination with chemotherapy. The preoperative workup. We need to do some imaging. We need to do an MRI, that's a routine scan. We need to do a CT scan, that's routine as well. It is recommended to do an FTG PET CT, and we do it uh, here in Switzerland, in Zurich. And the FTG PET MRI, well, that's the future. It's very promising due to its high sensitivity. And if you look at the numbers, you can see that the sensitivity is moderate, and whereas the specificity is high. Further preparation, by now we know almost everything about the lesions. We know their size, we know their number, we know their location. We need to know our anatomy, so the position, positional relationship of vessels, for example, um, and we need to know about possible contraindications and pitfalls. So, for example, signs of liver malfunction, and we know that uh, by doing the scans, for example, we can see indirect signs, we can see splenomegaly, for example, um, and that would lead to the conclusion that there might be portal hypertension or we see that by doing um, the liver function tests. And then we need to know if there are metastases to more than one organ since that might change our approach. And we need to know the function and size of the future liver remnant. And then there are patient-based factors. We need to know about the overall health status of the patient and um, we need to acknowledge the individual approach. Uh, and we need to know about core morbidities. What's our main goal to achieve? Or let's say like we have two goals to achieve. One is a complete removal of the tumor, and two is a sufficient remnant liver tissue. What are the, the requirements for the future liver remnant? It has to have a biliary drainage, it has to have a vascular in and out flow, and it has to function the way the normal liver does. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, if we opt for RO, is the future liver remnant able to cope? What are some risk factors for postoperative liver failure? Older age definitely is one. Cirrhosis, fibrosis, 
hepatitis, intraoperative blood loss, ischemia, obstructive cholestasis, preoperative chemotherapy, and steatosis. What about the functional capacity of the liver? If we have a healthy liver, the future liver remnant needs to be about 20% of the actual size. And 20% is very optimistic. We usually go for 25 to 30%. In a diseased liver, we need a future liver remnant, sorry, just 30 to 40%, the actual size. And in a chemotherapy pre-treated liver, we have to take an even larger future liver remnant, or leave an even larger future liver remnant of about 38%. As we know, only a small minority really qualifies for primary resection. In the majority of CRC liver metastases, they are unresectable. So we need strategies to one, reduce the tumor volume, and two, to maximize the future liver remnant. To reduce the tumor volume, we can use new adjuvant chemotherapy with or without targeted therapy. And to maximize the future liver remnant, we can do a portal vein occlusion, for example, via ligation or embolization, it doesn't matter. Um, or by two-stage hepatectomy and its variations. About new adjuvant ke chemotherapy. We usually do it as Folfox Folfory with or without biologic agents. It's the mainstay of therapy for patients with unresectable metastases, but it is controversial in patients with resectable liver metastases. And that's due to the fact that there are chemotherapy-associated liver injuries. <coughs> Um, this image basically serves as an example of how well chemotherapy works. And there's been a study in 2009, 49 patients were included, and they all got new adjuvant chemotherapy over a course of nine months. And what you can see is that the amount, wait, that the amount of lesions, that it did, in fact, decrease. And it's very impressive, I think. So we have a complete response rate of 8% in this particular group. And we have a partial response rate of 84%. And we have a conversion to resection rate of 47%. So half, almost half of all patients um, could be brought to a resectable state. What surgical options do we have? If we're lucky enough, we can do a primary resection. And if we're in not, then we do a stage for resection with volume manipulating strategies. The primary resection, we can do either an anatomical resection. The anatomical <coughs> resection, the lobes define the resection margin. And there are many different versions. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but this, these are just examples. So there's a right hemihepatectomy or, for example, the extended right hemihepatectomy, but I think you get the idea. And then there's a non-anatomical resection, and there the RO resection margins are the primary goal for surgical resection. And of course, this is a very liver parenchyma sparing technique. Let's talk about stage resection with volume manipulating strategies. And let's talk about the portal vein occlusion first. What you can see here is the liver, obviously. You have the left, no, you have the left lobe, you have the right lobe. You have a lesion in the right lobe and you have the portal vein and you have the left portal vein and you have the right portal vein. And what we want to do is we want to occlude the right portal vein. And what happens is you have, a, you have an increase in size of the left lobe and you have a decrease in size of the right lobe. So basically you have an atrophy of the tumor bearing side portion of the liver and you have a hypertrophic physiologic response um, in the non-embolized portion. And that all happens within a matter of three to four weeks. And I'm trying to visualize that by showing you this image. Top to bottom, left side, pre-intervention. Right side, post-intervention. Now what you can see is that when you occlude, and that's what you've done, when you occlude the right portal vein, then you have no blood flow to the right side and you have an, a growth of vessels, an increase of vessels on the left side. What you can also see is that you have a necrotic part of the right lobe of the liver and you have a growth of the left lobe of the liver. What are requirements for a two-stage hepatectomy? Well, you should have unresectable bilobar liver metastases. There should be a prior response to new adjuvant chemotherapy and one side needs to be less or not affected at all. 
Now, portal vein occlusion and conventional two-stage tapatectomy combined. What we see here, and you know this picture by now, we have multiple liver tumors in both sides, but the left side is less affected than the right side. That's one of the requirements. Um, we do the portal vein occlusion on the, right, on the right side of the liver, and we wait three to four weeks. And what happens is that not only do the lesions get smaller, but the left side of the liver also grows. And what we can do then is we can take out the right portion of the liver. And I forgot to say, we also, of course, via non-anatomical resection during step one, take out the lesions on the less affected lobe. So what's the problem here? Why don't we just do a two-stage hepatectomy and then we're good? In stage one, we do the portal vein occlusion and we take out the lesions of the less affected lobe. And then we wait for three to four weeks, and I've said that before. But during that period of time, we have a dropout rate of about 25 to 40% of all patient, patients, and they never undergo stage two. And why is that? It's mainly due to insufficient hypertrophy and disease progression. Now let's talk about the ALPS procedure. Again, our image, you know this. We do the portal vein ligature or embolization. We do the tumorectomy of the future liver remnant on that side. But what we do also now is we do an in situ split of the liver. And that's new. And this time we only wait one week. And already a hypertrophy of the future liver remnant happens. <laughs> We have an increase of volume of about over 30%. And we can go to stage two and do our right hemihepatectomy. We have a total volume increase of 50 to 200%. Now the data acquired here is based on a Scandinavian multicenter RCT that compared outcomes of ALPS and two-stage hemihepatectomy and it was published in the Annals of Surgery in 2018. And I want you to look at those top two numbers. The resection rate for ALPS in comparison to two-stage hepatectomy was 92% versus 57%. That's kind of impressive. And the RO resection rate is 77% versus 57% in two-stage hepatectomy. And the median overall survival for ALPS is 46 months whereas the median overall survival for two-stage hepatectomy is only 32 months. So the main difference between the conventional technique and ALPS is that the liver parenchyma is transected along the intended line of resection at the beginning of step one, and the clear advantages are volume increase, shorter interstage intervals, higher general resection rates and RO resection rates, and a longer median overall survival. We even have a treatment algorithm, and I've covered most of it already. Um, but let's go over this real quick. We have, let's say, a resectable tumor by stage one. Then we look at the future liver remnant. Is it lower or less than 30% or is it higher than 30%? If it is not, less than 30%, then we can go to resection or ablation. And if it's less, then we have to do the PVE, the portal vein embolization. And if it's still less than 30%, we go do an, a rescue ALPS. And if it's, if it's uh, large enough, we can do our resection abl and ablation. Now, when it's resectable by two stage, and that's what I talked about, before, then we do the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then we do the two-stage hepatectomy or ARPS procedure. But what do we do if it's unresectable by two-stage? We can do the conversion chemotherapy, and if it's then resectable by two-stage, we go ahead and do the two-stage hepatectomy or the ARPS procedure. And if after conversion chemotherapy, it's still unresectable by two-stage, 
we do a tumor control by chemotherapy. And if it's still not possible, then we have no other options but to do a palliative chemotherapy. But if it is a stable disease, then we could maybe do liver transplantation. And I haven't said anything about that yet. That's about to change. There are some exclusion criteria for liver transplantation. And I've set one already. That's the progressive, progressive disease under chemotherapy. That's, um, that's, a, that's an exclusion criteria. And then there is a large tumor size, high CA levels, and a less than two years time between the CRC and the liver transplantation. <coughs> and a BRAF mutation. That's a contraindication as well. And the inclusion criteria, well, they're the exact opposite of the exclusion criteria. In 2015, Dulin et al. did a study based on the SICA trial and the Nordic 7 trial, where they compared liver transplantation and chemotherapy. In the SICA trial, they included patients with colorectal liver metastases who received the liver transplantation. And the Nordic 7 trial, where they included patients with colorectal liver metastases who only received chemotherapy. And what we can see is that the progression-free survival for transplant patients was higher. And we can also see that the overall survival rate for transplant patients was higher or longer. Let's talk about the rapid procedure. Um, the rapid procedure is a combination of ALPS and liver transplantation, and it might be used in patients with inadequate future liver remnant for ALPS procedure. And it has been first described by Lina et al. in 2015, and it's been published in the Annals of Surgery. And at the time of transplantations, segments one to three are resected in the recipient and orthotopically replaced by segments two to three allograft. And the portal inflow is modulated um, by redirecting the portal flow to the graft with concomitant focus on keeping the portal vein pressure below 20. And then a second stage hepatectomy is performed as soon as the graft, um, as soon as the graft has regenerated to a sufficient uh, volume. And that might be a solution um, to the organ shortage problem we're having. Um, because right now we're dependent on um, deceased um, organ donors and with this procedure, um, we could rely on living organ donors. Almost done, but there are a few things worth mentioning. Um, what happens if we, if there's a recurrence? And um, recurrence happens in 60 to 70% of all patients, and 30% of those recurrences, they manifest in the liver again. And re-resection procedure is still the procedure of choice, um, simply because complication and mortality rates um, stay mostly the same. There's still a five years of rate of 35%, and there's no other non-surgical option there. Um, that's comparable. And then about timing. And there is three main scenarios. Primary is symptomatic, then we do the colon first. If we have an ext extensive liver metastases, then we do the liver first. And if we have fit patients who are asymptomatic <clears throat> or who have limited disease, we can do a simultaneous approach. So, what are our take home messages? Well, for now, and I think we know this by now, um, hepatic resection is the only curative treatment option available. And we need a multidisciplinary approach without exception. And that means that we have to get everyone on board, um, gastroenterologists, we need oncologists, we need radiologists, and it needs us, of course. And an individual approach is of utmost importance. Um, there is no um, one size fits all method and uh, we need to acknowledge that. And that was it. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation, tour de force in 20 minutes. I think you cover very well and very well explain uh, all the different therapy. Uh, the issue here, and we have now, and Dr. Chris Oberkofler and Povilas prepare a 
a paper for the uh, European Surgical, the problem is which one to choose in selection. You show the Zurich what we do here, uh, other people may do things differently. And when we present complex scenario to experts, so we speak about people who if published to our expert in levers, uh, in, a, in about half of the case, there would be completely different approaches. And the problem is that we are not sure, we don't have enough really level one data to know which one is best, etc. So there is still an ongoing discussion. The progress has been the different therapies that we have. So we can more often now go to other resection and safer, as you mentioned, uh, that we have enough lever left, that we have a low uh, mortality, but there is still a very ongoing discussion which therapy for what, and you even difference between the United States, where, for example, the APS procedure is not very popular, while in Asia, or particularly in Europe, but also a little bit more in Asia, uh, there's more experience uh, with the ALPS. The liver transplant, as you mentioned, is coming. Problem is immunosuppression, <coughs> and problem is that most of these patients that are transplanted, selected patients, will recur from the disease at this point uh, after some years. So there's clearly an advantage in overall survival, most likely quality of life, but we probably will not cure many of these patients. In the future, we may, if we learn, to if no immunosuppression or other strategy, probably we are more, uh, more efficient. But congratulations, it was a really excellent presentation. I know to open that for discussion. Thank you very much. Also, very nice presentation. I, I sort of missed the role of the radio frequency ablation or microwave ablation. Um, can you maybe, maybe you or your mentors <laughs> comment on that? I think in 20 minutes covering. I mean, I, I'm very happy. In fact, they did not develop this in this 20 minute uh, uh, presentations. I mean, the way we use this mostly in surgery is as an adjunct therapy. So we combine often resection. And then you have one single lesion and another location, and we can do uh, radio frequency. And now we favor microwave. There is more evidence as microwave is probably better, quicker. That is radio frequency. Uh, but in the real world, uh, there are many centers where it's done by radiologists, and they will take out uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or this metastasis. And here, clearly, uh, with some exception, uh, this is not as good as resection. So usually for colorectal liver metastasis, it has to be discussed, which was a multidisciplinary team. Uh, as an expert surgeon need to be involved, and if it's resectable, that should be resected. Part of that today, we can resect single metastasis, often by minimal invasives, either by laparoscopy or with the, uh, the, the robot. So maybe the indication, uh, the data will support that very small hepatocellular carcinoma, less than two centimeters, may benefit from radio frequencies versus surgery. But basically, all the rest, if it's resectable, uh, should be resected. Uh, I just wanted to ask two things we didn't cover, but might be of interest uh, for residents or any other, other people in the room. Um, we, we, do, we treat these patients a lot with chemotherapy, and the chemotherapies are getting better and better, and we see more and more disappearing lesions. So there is always the question, what do you do with these patients uh, where you do your chemotherapy and then you don't have the lesion anymore? Could you just wait and look if they're coming again, or should you rather resect those? And this is quite clear that in most cases there are still viable tumor cells in these disappearing or non-visible lesions, so you should resect also the part and look back to the old uh, CT or MRI where the lesions were and then just go for it and resect, although they were, they're not uh, seen anymore in the uh, images. So that's one thing. And the other thing what I want to mention, uh, because we always face this here also sometimes in the discussion, should we resect R0 or R1. Um, I think the first approach should be to have an R0 resection, but from the uh, outcome of the patient, the mortality, the R1 and R0 resections are not completely different. It rather depends on the tumor itself. It has some mutations like BRAF, uh, positive or negative, and in colorectal liver meds, it is also <coughs> acceptable to have a R1 resection most time we add some uh, burning or stuff which may add a little bit to this uh, field. But there are studies out where after R1 uh, resection, we don't have a higher recurrence on the resection side, rather somewhere else 
which means it's rather the tumor biology which dictates the overall mortality than the R1 or R0 resection. In colorectal liver mats, it's a bit different if you're talking about HCCs, but just two things we didn't see. We should maybe say when the surgeon should not be involved, right? Because obviously we do this surgery in many centers, or do this surgery now in a safer way, which a mortality maybe of 3%, very complex surgery, uh, uh, and we can have very many strategies we can take it out. So I think the, the, the situation where we should not even consider a resection or is when the chemotherapy does not work. So any tumor who progress on chemotherapy with very few exceptions is a contraindication for surgery. We do not help this patient, even if you can uh, take it out. So that's probably today, with all this chemotherapy, an important uh, take-home message. Okay. Good. All right, thank you.